Amen. Good morning. It's been a beautiful weekend with uh, two families coming together in marriage, Seth and Emily. And this morning, to hear God's word, that song that Dennis just led us could actually be the very first point in this morning's message. Um, If you haven't known already, everything that we do this morning points to Christ our Lord. This morning, I have the privilege to bring God's word to you as we continue our study in the book of John. So let's start. Today, any claim of truth can be challenging because a claim may be considered a power play or oppression. But since when is it a power play that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4? When it comes to Jesus and his exclusive claims, it stirs people up. According to a survey by Probe Ministries, 70% of born-again Christians disagree with the biblical position that Jesus is the only way to God. That's tragic. Only 25% of born-again Christians hold to a biblical worldview. And when it comes to God, only one-third of Americans, 55 and under, believe in an active creator God. It is important to clearly understand what Jesus said about heaven, himself, God, life, sin, death, and the things to come. Wherever you're at spiritually, you believe, skeptic, visitor, curious, or you have questions, I'm glad you're here today. Jesus brings clarity in a pluralistic, mixed up, confused world. Jesus has been teaching the disciples the past three years as they closely follow him, watch him. Jesus is giving them a, an important sermon direct, directed to his graduating class of 11. Unlike graduations where the graduates leave, it is Jesus' time as he will soon be leaving the graduates instead. Which brings us to this morning's passage, John 14, 1 to 14. In the chair Bibles, it is on page 901. Read with me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this morning. 
Thank you for your words, which is true. Thank you that we can hear your word and receive it. Let your servant this morning deliver the word accurately, faithfully, and Lord, that we may see, hear, understand, and glorify you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been with us in our study, it's I don't know about you, but it has been a rich study. This, the beginning of this month, we started in John chapter 13 and the farewell discourse. And John 13 can be considered the preamble to chapter 14, as we are at a juncture where Jesus focuses on his private ministry to the disciples. The disciples have been with Jesus for three years, and during this time, and during those times, his hour had not yet come, but now the time has come. Here Jesus gives encouragement and teaching as he is about to leave. The disciples would face their greatest crisis, Jesus and his crucifixion. Which brings us to the title of this morning's message, Jesus is the Way. Five points, true belief, future with the Father, Jesus is the way, Jesus is God, and greater works in glorifying the Father. One of the things in studying the Bible is to look at the meta-narrative, then breaking it down in the Old Testament, New Testament, genres, books, chapters, and verse. In particular, we want to look for a repetition. And in these 14 verses, we find these three words repeated. Believe six times, me, referring to Jesus, 11 times, and Father, 13 times. So keep these three words in mind as we go through the passage this morning. Point number one, true belief. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Again, the disciples spent three years with Jesus, living, eating, watching him. They were taught by Jesus, witnessing signs, witnessing miracles and healings. Jesus came with such fanfare just four days ago in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. In chapter 13, it is dark. It is the hour of Jesus. His time had come. We have Jesus washing the disciples' feet, serving them. The disciples were confused, perplexed, taken aback that Jesus was washing their feet, that Jesus would be betrayed by Judas, that Peter would deny Jesus, and the foreboding news that Jesus would leave them. The word trouble, which we already heard in that song, in itself is troubling. The word trouble here means to shake or stir up. And it's hard to not keep our hearts from not being troubled. This is really us today, perplexed, confused, ashamed, fearful, emotionally exhausted. We are coming upon two years of COVID. And who has not been impacted by COVID? It has been a worldwide event. And now we have overseas trouble with the re Ukraine and Russia. We had our jobs threatened, overreaching government, the death of loved ones. At times, there's trouble at the workplace, and I dare say even in our homes. Maybe it's with your spouse, in-laws, or, or even your kids. As Jesus was about to head to the cross, he himself was deeply troubled, John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. John 13, 21, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. 
In some sense, the disciples should have been comforting Jesus. But instead, our Lord comforts them by saying, verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The two verbs believe could either be imperative or indicative, but is more likely an imperative. These words of Jesus should be of great comfort. While Jesus has taught us to not be anxious and to not worry, this is more than knowledge. He says to trust in God and to trust in him. This is high Christology, as Jesus is linked with the Father as the object of our faith. Here we see the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son. While we won't ever be absent of troubles, it is a call to believe in God and believe in Jesus. Jesus is standing before the disciples about to be betrayed, abandoned, will be denied three times, and going to the cross. He puts out a call for faith. Jesus wants to assure the disciples. Jesus is imploring the disciples. This is the final push. Remember that Jesus, in the calling of the disciples, that the disciples left everything to follow Jesus. They left their jobs, their homes, their friends, their families. Jesus is acknowledging their troubled hearts and for them to put their confidence in God and him where there is security and peace. It is important to remember, dear brother, dear sister, that you are in Christ. You belong to Jesus. You are connected to Jesus. You have a relationship with Jesus, the Son of God. You have a relationship with God the Father. Jesus is commanding that you believe and believe fully in him and fully in God. Saint, friend, is your heart troubled? What's troubling you? Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. This is point number one, true belief. Point number two, future with the Father. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. I think it is a pretty safe statement to say that everyone wants to go to heaven. And yet, there are so many interpretations about heaven, even for Christians. Just go to any blog, website, movie, or streaming, or just talk to anyone on the street. Much of it is confusing, outright wrong, and even satanic. When Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms, he is clearly talking about heaven. When you think about a house, you think about a sanctuary. It is the American dream to own a home, and a home with many rooms. It is definitely not an apartment. Since living in LA, I've actually lived in 11 different places. Whether it's the Sunday paper, Daily Breeze, Beach Reporter, Wall Street Journal, or those weekly mailers about real estate, people seek and desire better housing. Rather, Jesus is talking about the best permanent home and an incredible mansion for his people. Jesus is preparing this place. It's not nirvana or Hinduism where you achieve a higher state or being of in the enlightenment. It is not temporary or affordable housing. In heaven, there are many rooms. Not a small crammed room. It will be akin to a Roman villa or a Chinese courtyard. God's house is better than any home you can imagine. However, God's house 
is only for his people. There's plenty of room for all the redeemed, for all those that are in Christ. And we need to remember that our final destination is heaven. And we will eventually see Jesus in our heavenly home. We follow and live for Jesus. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Deep down inside, we all have what C.S. Lewis says is an inconsolable longing. We have a longing for heaven, whether we recognize it or not. At funerals, they often say, or even on Facebook, they say, rest in peace. The reality is that those that are only in Christ, that believe in God, will have peace with God and will one day be home in heaven with him. Clink says this about the word place. It is the expression of the reality of life in and with God. Just as the word was in the beginning, so shall we be in the end with God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That at the end of our physical life, we will be with God. Revelations 21, verses 1 to 4. Listen to what the word says here about heaven. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, heaven from a God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Doesn't this sound like an incredible place? To be with God and dwell with him. No more pain. No more trouble. No more aches. No more pains. Then verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am going you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Here we now see a clear statement of Jesus about his second coming, his second advent. He's declaring that after the, his departure, he will return, and the promise of him, the good shepherd. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Jesus is reinforcing again from verse 1 of our passage that their belief in him and that the disciples should know what he is talking about. Here starts a series of questions by the disciples, first by Thomas and then by Philip. Again, the disciples really should already know the way. Jesus has been showing and teaching the disciples every moment that they've been with him. D.A. Carson says that John's point is not that Jesus had made some terrible error in assessing the disciples, but that precisely because they know him, they do know the way to the place he has just prescribed. Once again, it is by reading on and coming back and rereading the text that we find Jesus' anticipation of his clear, impending statement that he himself is the way. This is point number two, future with the Father. Point number three, Jesus is the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here Jesus eliminates all possible exceptions as he himself is the only way. Matthew 7:14, For the gate is narrow, 
and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Here we see the seven I am's and exclusive claims of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, John 10, 7 through 10. Jesus, so Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. And the key verse in this morning's message, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the seventh I am, I am the true vine. So here we see that the way is narrow, it is a gate, it is life, it is eternal life, it is the only access to heaven. Thomas seems perplexed, yet he asks, this is not Google Maps where there are multiple ways to get to a destination. And you know Google Maps has been wrong. <laughs> In verse 6, we come to an exclusive and profound claim by Jesus. And to many, it's offensive. Jesus' exclusive claims rejects these three things. One, he rejects inclusivism, which teaches that everyone is saved on the account of works as they don't have to put faith in Christ in order to be saved. Two, it rejects that you can be saved by general revelation. In Romans 1, we see that people reject the truth. They suppress the truth. General revelation is sufficient to condemn us, but not save us. We need special revelation of Christ to be saved. It rejects relativism, true for you, but not true for me. It rejects pluralism, that teaches that all beliefs are equal. The state of society now is that it is politically incorrect to make a truth claim that Christianity is the only truth and that Christ is the only way to salvation. To say that all religions are valid is impossible. If all ways are valid to God, then Christianity is a valid way to God and that Jesus is one of many ways to God. No, that is not so. John 14, 6 clearly teaches against this, as Jesus is the only way, and that no one can come to the Father except through him. It is important that man didn't come up with this idea, but Christ himself is the only way to the Father. Jesus is the only way to be saved. Acts 4, 12 and there, is no, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus also identifies himself as the truth. Jesus is the greatest teacher of all time. His statements are fact, and he was the only person in the world that was sinless. He not only tells the truth, he is truth. Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Truth came through Christ and no one else. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth that all scripture speaks of. John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bears witness about me. At every service, 
here at Redeem South Bay, just before communion, the pastor says these three things. As Pastor Jeff said, you are a gift to us. Two, we love you because God has first loved us. And we love you because we want to tell you the truth. And that truth can only be found in Jesus Christ as he is the embodiment of truth. We live in a time where truth is despised because people say that the relationship is more important than the doctrine of truth. Remember that intro I had about two plus two is equal to four? Truth matters. It is because of God's truth that we understand him, creation, our relation to God, relationship to Jesus, and our relationship to each other. That's how we can relate to each other. Because Jesus is truth, I can take comfort for every word of his. Scripture cannot be broken. In the words of the Christ and the Bible, I can have assurance and rest. To know the truth, you have to go to the source. Jesus is not only the incarnation of truth, but also the life. Jesus is the source of life of our Christian existence, for all of existence. He is the creator of all things, John 1, 3. He is life, John 1, 4. He has life in himself, John 5, 26. He is the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. In him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 22 to 28. This says, listen to these words. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus is the life as he gives us breath, and we are, we have life because of him. John Calvin says this, Jesus destroys the wall that divides humanity from God, which is the way, denies the falsehood that distorts humanity in relation to God, the truth, and defeats the last and greatest enemy to humanity, death, which is the life. Life is, imp is impossible without Jesus. Our very existence is because of Jesus. Jesus is life. We are alive because of Jesus. This harkens to the theme of this book, John 20, 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We can't know the Father, but only through Jesus and his exclusive claims. Point number three, Jesus is the way. Point number four, Jesus is God. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, 
that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Here we have a clear statement about Jesus and his relationship to the Father. There is probably no greater concentration of the references to the Father. Nine times is met, Father's mentioned in these verses, and 13 times Father is mentioned in this passage today. What is important is that the presence of Jesus is the presence of the Father. Jesus is explicitly called God, is explicitly called God, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.18, 1, John 10.30, that Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus is exhorting the disciples as they truly haven't fully grasped his teaching. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip responds, show us the Father. Let's put it in context. Philip has been with Jesus three years from the start of his ministry, where Jesus did his first miracle, turning water into wine, giving sight to the blind, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, raising the dead, healing the invalid, invalid, and was there at the transfiguration. Yet Philip was not satisfied. Just show me the Father, and I'll be satisfied. How many times have we personally asked God, show me this one thing, do this one thing? Jesus says to Philip, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? You can sense the force of an almost rebuke to Philip that he is still asking questions. Philip should already know this. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The disciples should already know this, and yet they don't. They were with God incarnate. No one has seen God in all his glory. They were with God incarnate. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. In the Old Testament, we have seen God manifest himself in a cloud, pillar of fire, or vision. This is called a theophany. Philip and the disciples wanted just one more vision. If you see Jesus, you see the Father. Here's an amazing claim of equality with the Father, claim of deity, claim of authority. Here we have a Trinitarian God, God the Father, God the Son. Believing is not an intellectual proposition, it says in verse 11, but that it is a faith in a living person. It is also not blind faith, as faith has intellectual content. You're not jumping into the darkness. You're actually jumping into the light. Go to the source. Look at the book of John and see the deeds, signs, and teachings of Jesus. All that Jesus has done shows the power of the Father. Throughout the epistles, we see Jesus being called God, Titus 2:13, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 1.8, but on the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith equal of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In believing, it is a command to believe in the unity of the Father and the Son. This is point number four, that Jesus is God. Point number five, greater works in glorifying the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, 
that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. As Jesus addresses the 11 disciples, he is saying that they will be doing the works that Jesus did. This moves us past Jesus' departure to the Father and the disciples' mission after Jesus' exaltation. We see the soon transition from Jesus' completed work on the cross and the transition of the disciples from active witnesses to active ministers of Jesus Christ. We will see the ministry of the disciples and their works in the Acts of the Apostles and greater works as they have greater reach and extent of their active ministry beyond Judea, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Further in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the mighty works of conversion. The disciples will not be left alone, but will be empowered by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be empowering their ministry for greater reach than Jesus had to the ends of the earth because Jesus is going to the Father. This is the promise of God's help per to the disciples. It is the transition from pre-glorification works of Jesus to the post-glorification of Jesus through the disciples in their ministry and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that ministry is to be fueled by prayer. Verse 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And we have to be careful with this verse that there are many false teachings about prayer. And in particular, if you pray for anything in Jesus' name, that it will be done like magic? No. No. One's prayer is to be aligned with the purposes of God, is to be consistent with God's will as an agent of Jesus. Prayer is the lifeblood of a Christian. It was so with Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, and how he taught us to pray in the Sermon of the Mount. It is also a reminder of a believer's dependence upon Jesus, and that he will supply every need, and that he promises and continues to care for the troubled disciples. 1 John 5:14, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to the, his will, he hears us. Christian, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. God is glorified in the sun when we trust in the sun. Do the work of the sun and pray in Jesus' name. This is point number five. Greater works in glorifying the Father. And to sum it up again, Jesus is the way. True belief. Future with the Father. Jesus is the way. Jesus is God. Greater works in glorifying the Father. And I'll close with this. A theologian said this of John 14, 6. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. For those of you that don't yet believe, consider Jesus as Lord, as he is the only way, the embodiment of truth, the embodiment of life. Because without Jesus, there really is no living. Don't you want to live? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this morning, the message about you being the only way, and that we have life only through the Son. And through the Son, we have access to the Father. And in our access to the Father, we have heaven. We pray, Lord, that the words have gone out, 
that it would be received, that it would be received in hearts of flesh, that you would soften those hearts. Mold us, Lord. Use us, Lord, that we may glorify you because of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.